Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today. You are part of the 420 people worldwide who have registered to view this webcast, powered by YOL development, dedicated to 3D and 2.5D DSV integration. My name is Faisal El Kamasi. I'm a global sales support and coordinator for YOL development. Before we get started with this webcast, I would like to give you some information regarding the logistics. So you have the possibility during all the webcasts to submit questions. In order to do so, you simply have to use the box at the bottom of the screen where you can see Ask a Question. We will answer as many questions today as time permits, and for the remaining question, we will make a following up via mails within a week. We'll do our best to do that. Concerning the materials and content, please note that the presentation is available and that you will have the possibility to download it in the material section. You will also receive an email later after the webcast with a link to the recorded session. So today, your development, System Plus Consulting, and how proud sponsor Broadpack will share their analysis for you to learn more about 3D and 2.5D TSV integration. First, let's start with an overview of the related industry and the latest market and technology developments presented by Emily Jolivet, Market and Technology Analyst at Yol Development. Emily, please. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I am Emily, um, and I'm here to give you an overview of the markets and the applications of 3D TSV integration. We've done a webcast on TSV integration in January on this topic, and one can ask, uh, why are we doing one today? Actually, because many things happen since January, and, uh, and it's time to, to cover the, this topic. So, many things uh, on the agenda. Uh, so, for, for newcomers, I would like to start uh, spending some time about definition and history of TSV integration. Then, uh, I will cover the application, uh, specifically imaging and high performance, with a focus on artificial intelligence and then spend a couple of minutes on technology and specifically um, what we expect in the coming years. So what is 3D integration? So we consider a 3D TSV technology two things. When the device is completely stacked and interconnected with two silicon vias, so in this case we talk about 3D IC and that's mainly memory and logic or logic and memory. And the second case is the 2.5D technology when chips are assembled on a silicon interposer and then in this case the TSV is also used as the electrical interconnection but um, the second case covers the package of the GPU, CPU, uh, stack memory and we will see there are more things in the future that will come or fall under this category. In terms of application, um, YOL has made a breakdown of three types, three ranges of products. So there is the low-end product, mainly main sensors and high brightness LEDs, where the driver is the form factor. There is the second case of the middle end um, that consists mainly in imaging CMOS image sensor for mobiles, where the drivers are form factor but also the performance. It will be the first part of this talk. And the second part is about high end or high performance devices, where the driver is clearly the performance and the applications are a bit more diverse, as we have the 3D stack memories, silicon interposer, but also. Uh, we expect soon the 3D system on chip and silicon photonics uh, also in the future. So what has made this 3D integration possible? Actually, TSV entered the consumer device uh, more than 10 years ago uh, with the VIAS technology, and it has progressively penetrated more markets. 
and the amygdala have enabled large bandwidth zero memories, which is um, a hot topic now. So as I said, the learner curve was initiated in 2007, and now designer, foundries, and others have built um, a reliable and complete supply chain worldwide. In imaging, so <laughs> PSV integration has played a major role in thermal image sensor in smartphone evolutions, and mutually, thermal image sensor have played a major role for TSV integration. Um, in terms of wafer, in 2016, there was almost 1 million 12-inch wafer uh, TSV wafers manufactured worldwide. So. Um, it's quite important for the TSV business. Even though a few years ago there was no use of TSVs, uh, the introduction of the BSI stack technologies have uh, fostered the adoption. And 3D integration is now essential, and there is no alternative now for the mobile. So to gain in performance and to answer the new requests, new needs of consumers, that they are quite, there were quite a lot of change in smartphone camera over the last years, and we expect more to come. To illustrate uh, this year, Sony has launched a triple stack CES with a thin DRAM stack between pixel layers and digital signal processor. It was the first time that we see a three wafer stacked, uh, and this evolution. Um, comes one year after Samsung uh, introduced the copper cover hybrid bonding uh, CES uh, in its smartphone. In the next generation, um, we expect also new hybrid bonding, and um, most likely there will be a pixel level interconnect coming with a lower pitch. So, actually, integration is essential for CIS. Many technologies are under development. And these millions of 12-inch wafers is likely to grow um, year on year uh, at a quite uh, nice pace. Other fields of application that integrates copper, copper, or let's say so hybrid bonding, it's the 3D imaging and sensing. So y'all will be dedicating a webcast on this specific new device on the 26th of September. But just to give you um, a brief view of that, so uh, this new type of sensing um, will also uh, fulfill the needs uh, of the consumer through the, the smartphone. And the idea uh, is to have an extra camera enabling the 3D imaging. And uh, hybrid bonding uh, will have also a role to play in this field. The second uh, main field of the TSV integration uh, now is the high performance application. So you can ask what is high performance application? Actually, uh, there are a lot, um, even though that's, that was considered as niche market. Now there are some uh, hot topics um, around, especially uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence. And here, uh, TSV have a, have a role to play. So because TSV device enables the transfer of large amount of data at high speed, get access to data with minimum latency, and store huge amount of data. So in high performance business, we consider cloud computing, gaming, high performance computing, networking in data center, and in the future, we will add more augmented reality headset that will also require um, minimum latency and high-speed uh, data transfer. So this uh, slide was to help um, bridging the gap between the device and the market. So as you can see, uh, on the row. So high city and networking, more or less the data center field, require many 3D stack devices like the 3D stack memory cube, the silicon center browser, and 3D system on chip. 
but also there is the field of data analytics, which can take place in dedicated server or in big data centers, also um, very needing of uh, high bandwidth. And there is the consumer computing that is more or less a new field that of use of uh, 3D stacked memories or in general 3D stacked devices. But in this case, this year we heard about the iMac Pro from Apple uh, using the AMD card based on HBM2 that Romain will introduce a bit later. We heard also about the use of the HBM1 in the game device X Xbox One. And there is also the other fields of aerospace defense, automotive computing, medical computing, um, that require a lot of data analytics. And they, they need these new um, high performance PSV integrated devices. This slide was also to, um, to retranslate the number of CSV commercial launch that took place, uh, that occurred along the, over the last year. So as you can see, there were many devices um, launched recently. Even so, it started in 2011 with Xilinx, uh, FPGAs from Xilinx. There was uh, progressively the introduction of more and more complex and performant devices. So in 2014, there was the launch of the HBM1 uh, and also uh, DDR4 stack memories from Samsung and SK Enix, which are the two main uh, stack memory manufacturers. And there, it follows up with uh, more commercial products like the NVIDIA GPU Pascal and the GPU Fiji from AMD. So you see uh, it's the very big name companies having now commercial uh, solution using TSV, and we know that there will be more in the future um, because NVIDIA and AMD are expecting, um, we expect new products um, continuously uh, using uh, 3D stack memories. So as you may have noticed, there was uh, over the last year many articles, many talks about artificial intelligence and deep learning as it's a hot trend. Um, I won't read every one, but I think it's quite interesting to ask why deep learning takes place now. It actually takes place for three reasons. Deep learning is a process that consists in educated machines. But for that, there was a first need of database to do it. And now with Facebook, Instagram, there is large uh, available database of images. And it was the first step. The second one was more about the availability of the hardware um, offering large bandwidth as the type of device we mentioned previously. And there is the application side when there is now new needs in efficient data analytics solutions for the fintech, for autonomous driving, or just for consumer um, application in mobiles. Oh, sorry, that's a jump. Um, so there is indeed a recent opportunity because deep learning um, gained popularity along the last years. And as I said, uh, the goal is to educate machine in identifying patterns, and it's now used mainly for language processing. But there is a lot of image recognition application which are under development. So how does it work? It takes place in two steps. One phase that is called training, and it takes place in data centers, and it consists in really training, educating the neurons. So this part of the um, process requires um, transfer of data at high speed. So the need of the bandwidth is here. And there is a second state that is the decision or inference state that can take place uh, or in a data center or it can be embedded on a device, on a car, on a smartphone. This one is less demanding in terms of bandwidth but those two steps are correlated, and we see now uh, many companies making uh, announcements on this process. 
So one can ask what's the link between 3D TSV and the deep learning. Actually, that the capability of stacking, reducing the interconnection have helped to uh, achieve the performance. Here are some examples uh, of products which are used for training, and there is the Tesla P100 that Romain will show, but also now the, the AMD that we will also show. I wanted to highlight something that is um, a bit new, actually, in the semiconductor industry, is that the, um, what is at stake, the challenge of the high-performance computing and deep learning is high. And now we see a slight motion, but quite interesting to consider, and that could have some consequences in the future. Right now, the big giant web companies like uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook in USA, but also Tencent and Alibaba in China or Baidu, they tend to have their own internal design, at least for the inference die and they get involved from the very beginning, from the very first step of the design of the chip. And the second move actually is coming from card processor companies like NVIDIA or AMD, Intel. They tend to go towards the system development, like NVIDIA, which has launched um, a complete server dedicated to deep learning. So those change are small or little change, but have to be considered because the involvement of tier one will have some impact uh, on the supply chain. In terms of market, what does it mean? Y'all actually estimates that the size of the market in 2008 18 will be around 360,000 TSV wafers 12 inch. So it can be considered as a niche market, but when you consider the value of the wafer, whether it is an interposer or a memory uh, with TSV inside, the value of the business um, is quite important. And you can see that we have a, a growth about 27% in the next six years. So it's a market that is um, that has taken that has taken off progressively. I wanted also to discuss a little bit of technology. I know that Romain will show you some uh, nice pictures of high bandwidth memory, but just a uh, status. So right now HBM1, HBM2 are available, and HBM3 is under development at JEDEC. Uh, th there are still some discussion at JEDEC, but samples are scheduled for 2019. Um, in terms of die partitioning, um, there are, as I said, there is the 3D system on chip now coming, but there, there is the, the die partitioning that also getting more interest, and Farhang will uh, highlight uh, the, the use of uh, the, die, the, the silicon interposer. And to me, there is something that has to be considered when we talk about TSV integration, because TSV has a cost. Even though it brings performance, it has a cost. And now uh, IDMs and OSATs are working on developing alternative technologies which should be low cost. And actually, there are a lot of development um, on a kind of a high density fan out or let's say, upgraded fan-out style technologies like uh, Info or Focus, Swift. And there is the EMIB that is now the solution used by Intel for, for the FPGA strategy stem. So I just wanted to open the door to say, OK, 3D TSV technologies are getting interest. There is a market for it because it brings performance. Well, no other technology could bring performance before. But there are also some challengers, and it has to be considered in the future. So th thank you. <laughs> I will let Roma show you nice pictures now. 
Thank you, thank you very much, Emily, for this very interesting presentation. So, once again, do not hesitate to ask questions using the Q&A button for the Q&A session that we will do at the end of the webcast. So, we will continue with a presentation from Roman Fro, Chief Technology Officer at System Plus Consulting, with a presentation on 3D and 2.5D TSV in GPU Quad Technology Review. So, please, Roman. Thank you very much, Faisal. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Emily, also for the, the nice uh, presentation. Uh, so today my presentation will be quite simple. In fact, I will uh, show you two examples of uh, uh, GPU cards which have been released on the market uh, quite recently. So one from uh, NVIDIA and another one from AMD. Uh, so in order to highlight uh, the main components uh, which are used by uh, both players and also to, uh, to show the differences in terms of, uh, of integration. So let's start with uh, an example of, uh, of NVIDIA. Uh, so NVIDIA released the uh, end of last year uh, the Tesla P100 uh, uh, holding uh, the Pascal GPU, GP100. Uh, so these uh, graphic cards are mainly uh, uh, made for uh, data centers uh, with some specifications which are uh, highlighted on the slide here. Uh, so we received the board um, at System Plus uh, during the year and uh, we uh, realized the teardown in order to have access uh, to the electronic board and to have access to the, the main GPU holding uh, uh, the memory uh, with uh, HPM2. So here you have uh, uh, pictures of, uh, of the board uh, uh, showing uh, the main uh, uh, integration. In terms of, uh, of, uh, of GPU here, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the main package is a 55 by 55 millimeter package size, so it's quite a standard, in fact, in terms of, uh, of size for such a uh, large GPU. Uh, NVIDIA released two versions of, uh, of uh, the Pascal uh, uh, P100, one holding uh, 12 gigabytes of uh, memory, of HBM2 memory, and another one holding uh, 16 gigabytes of uh, HBM2 memory. So as uh, for the previous HBM product, which has been released on the market in the, in the previous years, uh, the dies are directly uh, stacked onto an interposer, so we have side-by-side -side, uh, the HBM stacks with uh, the GPU on a large interposer, which is also uh, directly uh, integrated onto uh, PCB laminate. In terms of uh, footprint, uh, we can easily understand that uh, this such uh, products are uh, able to save a lot of space at the board level. Uh, we already made in the past some uh, comparison between solutions using DDR4 or DDR5 uh, directly uh, inside standalone packaging at the board level compared to uh, HBM stack uh, at the interposer level. Uh, so for sure it saves a lot of footprint, so 50% uh, according to, to, to manufacturers. And again, in terms of performance also, it's uh, much more better uh, linked to uh, the small uh, uh, connection between GPU and, uh, and memories. If we have a look now at the supply chain of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, processing unit here, um, so for the NVIDIA Tesla P100, we can observe that um, TSMC is the main player, in fact, uh, dealing with uh, the integration of uh, all of uh, the silicon dyes. Uh, the HPN stack, the GPU interposer. Uh, so what we can observe here at uh, the component level is that we have a very large GPU, which is close to a 600 square millimeter, using a 16 nanometer thin fed process made by TSMC. Um, stacked uh, just on the side of the GPU, we have four uh, uh, HBM stacks, uh, each of them holding uh, four gigabytes of memory uh, with a total of uh, 16 gigabytes of memory for, for the complete uh, structure. And as I said, there is also another version holding uh, 12 gigabytes. In this case, uh, we observe that uh, they are just using a, a fake uh, HBM stack in order to uh, hold the same structure uh, with uh, four uh, stacked, uh, because at the end we have uh, a complete uh, thinning of uh, the HBM stack and the GPU uh, in order to have uh, the final thickness uh, quite homogeneous. 
So on the side, uh, on the on the right side of the slide, in fact, you have a schematics uh, showing uh, uh, the structure of uh, the component with uh, the estimated supply chain. Uh, so this uh, this schematic is not to scale here because uh, you can observe the, the DRAM stacks, the HBM stack. It's uh, higher compared to the GPU, but in reality, of course, uh, the GPU and the HBM stack uh, share the same uh, final thickness. Uh, so here we uh, observe that uh, the HBM stack is provided by Samsung, and uh, the GPU dies, <coughs> as I said, is made by uh, by TSMC with a 16 nanometer thin set process. Both GPUs, GPU and HBM stacks are uh, directly uh, connected through in a 2.5D interposer, silicon interposer, holding also uh, uh, the very middle uh, TSV. And uh, this process, uh, called the, the CoWoS, chip on wafer on substrate, uh, developed by TSMC, uh, enable TSMC to directly connect all of the dye at the wafer level, and then at the end, uh, uh, directly connecting the final uh, GPU, HBM, and interposer on uh, a PC substrate. So here we have a laminate substrate, which is quite impressive, uh, quite impressive because it's all the uh, 12 metal layer. Not so common for uh, an advanced uh, uh, ICs. Uh, so we observed 10 metal layer in the past. Uh, so 12 metal layer for this separate is quite uh, impressive in terms of uh, of, uh, of material. Uh, we assume that uh, it is made by uh, Ibidon, but uh, maybe it's another player also uh, uh, which is uh, uh, providing this uh, this substrate. Uh, the, as I say, the process which is used uh, for this integration is uh, the CoWoS process of TSMC. Uh, so TSMC is providing different platforms according to uh, the kind of, uh, of, uh, of packaging and the kind of, uh, of uh, package size, die size, integration, uh, and number of IOs. So here we have a package and die size which are really large. Uh, we have an interposer which is more than uh, one square millimeter, uh, one uh, uh, thousand square millimeter, sorry. Uh, so uh, the process which is used by TSMC here is uh, the CoWoS XL uh, due to the large size and the number of I.O. which is also uh, really impressive at this, uh, at this level of integration. Regarding the memory, the HBM stack now, uh, so we have uh, HBM2 here, and as I said, it is uh, directly made by Samsung, so Samsung is a provider of uh, this HBM2 uh, stack. Uh, so we have four stacks of uh, four gigabytes, so we have uh, uh, for one HBM stacked, we have four memory dies which are stacked uh, with uh, the middle TSV and connected uh, on top of uh, a buffer die, a logic die. Uh, so here, in terms of, uh, of number, uh, Samsung uh, estimates that there is more than 5,000 TSV uh, per dies uh, on, on uh, each uh, DRAM uh, component. Now, if we compare with uh, another provider of uh, 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 GPU this year, uh, AMD released a very interesting uh, graphic card uh, holding the Vega 10 GPU. Uh, so we analyze uh, the AMD Radeon Vega Frontier Edition uh, this year. In terms of integration, uh, again, it integrates uh, HBM2 uh, with uh, 16 gigabytes also of, uh, of capacity of memory. And uh, compared to uh, the solution uh, used by uh, NVIDIA, uh, you can see here that uh, AMD only used two stack of HBM uh, close to the GPU. So you have a GPU here, which is a little bit uh, smaller compared to NVIDIA, with five, close to 500 square millimeter <coughs> using a, a 14 nanometer thin set process. And two stack of HBM2, holding each of them each 8 uh, gigabyte of memory for, for a total of uh, 16 gigabytes of, of memory. The final BGA package is a little bit smaller compared to uh, the previous solution they released for, for uh, the Radeon Fury X, for example. So you have a, a 47 by 47 millimeter BGA package. And if we have a look at the supply chain here, uh, we can observe that uh, the HBM stack uh, here it's also offered by Samsung. Uh, so previously, for the previous uh, AMD uh, solution, it was SK Enix, uh, the provider of, uh, of the HBM stack. And uh, for the GPU die here, it's uh, Global Foundries, which is providing uh, this uh, 14 nanometer thin process. 
we assume that the interposer also could be provided by Global Foundry, but uh, it's uh, an assumption we made at this time. Maybe uh, uh, we'll have to, to confirm this uh, later on. And the BDA package substrate here, uh, it's a 10 layer, uh, 10 metal layer PCB substrate. Uh, previously, it was provided by IBDEN, so uh, uh, we can also estimate that it is uh, provided uh, again by IBDEN in, in this case. In terms of uh, final integration of uh, the stack, the GPU interposer on top of the substrate, uh, we assume that uh, ASC is uh, uh, the main player holding this integration, uh, but uh, we also know that MCOR has the capability to, uh, to realize this, and uh, maybe AMD is a uh, dual source uh, uh, the final integration with ASC and, uh, and MCOR for uh, the integration at, uh, at the substrate level. Regarding the HBM stack now, so uh, HBM2 again for this one, uh, but what you can observe here is that uh, now they integrate uh, uh, an HBM stack of uh, density of uh, 8 gigabytes, which is quite new on the market. Uh, at System Plus, it's the first time, in fact, we observed this uh, 8, 8 gigabyte of HBM2 memory. Uh, so we have uh, a stacking of uh, 8 DRAM dies, uh, each of them holding uh, uh, 1 gigabyte of, uh, of capacity. So in terms of integration, it's quite uh, interesting uh, because uh, uh, as you can observe, the final thickness of the, of the stack is the same compared to uh, a four die stacking. Uh, you can just observe that the final die is uh, less thick compared to uh, the previous uh, HBM stacks, uh, which were made by uh, Skynix or Samsung uh, with uh, four dies. Again, the goal at the end is still to have the same thickness as the GPU in order to have a very homogeneous uh, uh, area and uh, to, to, to green at the end. And so here, uh, for, for us, it's the first time we observe this, uh, this, uh, this solution. Uh, we were thinking uh, that SKNX were the main provider for AMD, but uh, maybe SKNX is not uh, yet ready, in fact, to provide uh, with a high volume production uh, HBM2 uh, eight, uh, with an 8 gigabyte uh, capacity. So if you make a comparison between a, a, a solution which has been provided by AMD in the past, so for the uh, Radeon 3X, compared to this new one, we can observe that, uh, of course, in terms of performance, uh, you have a, a three times more throughput uh, in terms of, uh, of teraflops. Uh, again, in terms of, integra in, of integration, uh, the package here is a little bit smaller with the new version, uh, 47 by 47 millimeter compared to uh, 55 by 55 millimeter. But uh, the GPU dies uh, is also reduced uh, with a, a die size of 500 square millimeter compared to 600 square millimeter in the past, linked to the shrink of uh, the process, uh, which is now a 14 nanometer fin fed process compared to a 28 nanometer process in, uh, in the past. In terms of integration of uh, the HBM memory, uh, now AMD made the choice to have only two stacks of, uh, of 8 gigabytes, uh, and uh, previously it was four stacks of 1 gigabyte. Uh, so we can observe that now uh, the capacity is four, uh, four times more important. And in terms of capacity per stack, uh, the, 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 the ratio is eight times more important for uh, the new HBM2, which is much more comfortable in terms of integration. Uh, in terms of uh, footprint saving also, uh, in order to have at the end a smaller component uh, with uh, a better uh, performance. So to conclude on these two products, uh, we can observe in fact that uh, there is more and more products which are using 2.5D and 3D TSV uh, each year. Uh, so we firstly analyzed uh, the AMD 3X uh, two years ago. Uh, it has been released in 2015. Uh, so in 2016, also new products have been released, and now in 2017, also uh, two new products are released on the market. Uh, so we can observe now that via the TSV for interposer for stacking of memory uh, are or seems to be very mature, uh, which is a good news for this industry. In terms of a standard for HBM, so HBM2 now seems to be the new standard for the advanced uh, GPU card. Uh, for the two products we analyzed, uh, Samsung were the, the, the main provider. Uh, of course, we don't know if uh, both players, uh, NVIDIA or AMD, uh, plan to uh, have SKNX in the, in the roadmap also. Uh, we can just observe that maybe Samsung seems to be in advance uh, 
at least for the 8 uh, gigabyte, gigabyte cycle of SBM2, and maybe AMD will uh, diversify after that uh, the supplying, the sourcing with uh, SKNX and Samsung. So thank you very much. I give now the end to uh, the next speaker. Okay, many, many thanks, Romain, many thanks for your presentation. So let's continue and end with a presentation from Farhang Yazdani, CEO and President of Broadback Corporation on 3D and 2.5D TSV integration from imaging to deep learning. So Farhang, please. Well, thank you so much for the intro. Um, I am going to take uh, about 10 minutes or so going uh, over a few observations that we see across the industry here. Um, so I uh, briefly wanted to kind of talk about the rapid change in the market demand. This is something that um, Roman as well as uh, Emily talked about it. Um, I would like to talk a bit about the IP reuse. That's where the push is and, uh, you know, we see some, uh, some, some changes in demand in this area. I'll then talk about uh, very briefly about the heterogeneous element of the of the deep learning the type of you know the options in terms of the, of the packaging etc. Um, I will also talk about the, the substrate, the silicon as the foundation of such type of integration, and I will wrap it up by talking about some of the key enablers and some key message um, at the very end. Um, so as you've seen so far from the presentation from Emily, um, there has been quite a bit of change in the market. Um, from our side, we see change in, in demand in the IP reuse. And uh, meaning that once the IPSU design can be reused and integrated with other geologics, and uh, for that, the heterogeneous type integration is going to be the key enabler, and that's going to be needed. Um, the other area uh, that was just talked about was the AI, the machine learning, and the deep learning area. And for that, we see the, the demand for the HPM, the high bandwidth type of with some memory, uh, the two and a half D, 3D type integration, as well as fan out, or it could be just a traditional uh, set. So it depends on the application. So for the high performance type application, HPM 2.5D is the route. And for other types, the, the, the traditional SIP uh, would be adequate for that. So talking about the IP reuse, um, the, what is driving uh, this request is, is really the cost reduction. And to be able to reuse the IP uh, uh, to connect with any type of core. So in this case, the customer would be supplying the core to logic based on their own thoughts. And they should be able to easily connect to the peripheral you know, IPs um, that is available off the shelf. So um, we call those the IP chiplets. Um, example could be PCIe, could be HDMI, could be, let's say, memory 5, you know, et cetera. So, so uh, the future of the SOC should be, uh, you know, by more of an assembly of these IP chiplets um, to the customer's core. And that's how things are happening. And, uh, but to make this a reality and uh, to push forward, of course, a unified interface, a common interface is going to be needed, uh, a kind of a standard that um, everybody can to design their IP according to the standard and, should, and that should take care of uh, the integration uh, among all the customers. And that work uh, is ongoing. Uh, we are hoping uh, within a year or perhaps by end of the next year we should have some form of a standard and, uh, that everybody can agree to at least to some point. And that should uh, make the heterogeneous type integration uh, more of a mainstream. The other market that it was just talked about, it was mentioned, was the was the neural network and the machine learning, deep deep learning type things. The way that we see it, you know, there are three types um, of uh, of requests for that. It could be the simple network, um, where 
um, there would be just one single to monolithic dye that would go on a basic P PBGA package or just a flip chip GBGA. That could be just a GPU dye or a CPU or, or just a FPGA. Um, and that should get the job done. Or, or it could be more of a combination of the CPU, GPU, accelerator, FPGA, let's say some memory uh, that would be integrated through a system in a package more in form of the flip chip dies and uh, or it could be just um, a package on package that you have the CPU GPU on one package and you perhaps you got the uh, I was uh, uh, memory on the other package in in these are being stuck um, again this is ongoing however the one that we see uh, uh, the demand and on the rise is more of of the of the of the of the deep network for for the two and a half to 3D platform, as well as the HPM, where a lot of memory is going to be needed, and um, and uh, connected through a two and a half D and 3D type platform. Um, now, having said all of that, the question becomes. The mechanism for connecting uh, to these two devices, what type of substrate, uh, and what is going to be needed. Uh, from what we see, silicon is a really a multifaceted substrate. Uh, and uh, for one thing, we can make it definitely with the high aspect ratio TSV. But the processing has actually evolved for making the TSV, so a much higher aspect ratio is possible now, is being done. And once this capability of, uh, is happening, we can make larger body size in terms of the interposer, meaning we can manage the coplanarity that goes on it. And, uh, and that should uh, make the ability to make um, a larger s system. Um, the silicon can be, again, to be considered just as an interposer that sits between the dye and the organic substrate or just as a standalone substrate by itself. So, so you've got two options here, how you want to package it. Um, it could be just a multi-layer. We can have multiple layer uh, RDL. We're, we're talking about three, four, or even more available uh, right now in the market. Um, the sub one micron line spacing, that's again with 65 nanometer or lower, you know, I mean that type of line spacing um, is available, um, is possible to make very high bandwidth, very wide bus connectivity among the devices. <laughs> one of the most important features um, of the silicon that has been selected as for majority of this application um, is to consider the high thermal conductivity. Is a, a great conductor of heat, and that's one of the main challenges of the packaging: how to how to manage the heat. And this is one way to do it, basically. Um, the high-speed signaling. Uh, there are many mechanisms to to manage to transmit the high-speed signal through the through the RDL as well as through the silicon itself. So that is not an issue. Uh, the processing capabilities out there to embed the passives, the caps resistors, the inductors, either on the surface or, or embedding within the RDL. So that is also a very attractive feature that is available. The other feature is that the interposer, we can make it active. Part of it could be active, and for many applications, you might want to have some kind of a logic on the interposer as well, or whatever functionality or the, or the demand. So that's going to be very important. The other thing is the wafer level fan out. Um, we believe that the fan out capability is going to be very important uh, for this to market the ability just to fan out the very fine pitch to a bit of a larger pitch for the ease of integration for other type packaging. So talking about the key enabler, um, we believe that the standardization on the chiplet IO interface is the key um, enabler for the heterogeneous type integration, and that's going to be very important for the IP reuse. That way, everybody across the industry can share the IPs uh, with the customer's logic. That's going to be important. 
mechanism for the non-good dyes or the chiplets in this case. So the IP provider um, should be able to, to provide the non-good of the chiplet. Um, interposers, whether going to call it the substrate or the interposer, uh, fine pitch with minimum at least, I would say two layer of the RDL is going to be needed uh, to manage this type of connectivity. Um, the other thing is the fine pitch, I would say bumping, the, the bumping houses, the capability to bump at a fine pitch is going to be important. Um, the ability to do the fan out, the fine pitch fan out capabilities, that's going to be also important. Um, uh, I think this is the key, uh, the key important feature here. And lastly, the fine pitch die to wafer assembly capabilities to be able to assemble the fine pitch um, IP chiplets onto the substrate or to the other uh, wafer is going to be important. Um, with that, uh, the key message that I have is re really to to make the IP reuse uh, uh, move forward. The heterogeneous two and a half D fan out platform is going to be needed for that, and that's what is happening as we speak. Um, know that that the memory is the key is the key player. In fact, the memory is one of those component is going to drive this type of uh, um, I would say integration. And that for the for the deep learning as well as the AI, again the heterogeneous two and a half D and fan out packaging is going to be the key driver and it's going to be needed. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end my slides. Uh, I'm open to any question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for this relevant and interesting information. So we are now going to wrap up with a Q&A session. So we will answer as many questions today as time permits. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for that and follow up via mails on the remaining question. Okay, so I think the first question, Romain, we have a nice one for you. So what are the processes used for NVIDIA and IMD interposer? So Romain, if you can help us for that, to understand. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, if I can uh, answer quite quickly on this uh on this part, uh, we, we just observed, in fact, that the, the processes are quite different for both solutions. Um, so IMD is uh, still using uh, an interposer process with uh, uh, a backend online uh, with a dual Damascene process, so it's copper metal layers. Uh, if we compare to the previous solution, now it's using four metal uh, layers for the, the, the backend online, uh, four layers of dual Damascene copper, so it's quite uh, interesting. And uh, regarding to the NVIDIA, uh, for, for NVIDIA here, the process is uh, a little bit different because uh, NVIDIA for this interposer is using only one copper metal layer for the interposer uh, and also one aluminum layer. So there is still two metal layers, but uh, one copper and uh, one aluminum here. Okay, thank you, Roman. Um, one question perhaps for Emily. Um, what is the status of pixel level interconnected technology, uh, meaning size of pitch? Um, so, so the status of the pixel interconnection, let's say pixel level interconnection, so that's under development. The, the commercialization is more estimated around 2019. Uh, regarding the size of the pitch, that will be, yeah, around 1.2, 1.4 micron, most likely. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, perhaps for you, Roman. What are the thicknesses of the DRAM dies in the HBM stacks? Um, the thicknesses here are uh, they, quite, they are quite uh, close to 50 micron for both uh, stacks. Uh, so the only uh, uh, the, the final stack thickness, in fact, uh, compared to uh, 4 uh, gigabyte and 8 gigabyte, are very similar. In order to uh, to to 
to be able to uh, to do the same thickness compared to the GPU, uh, and so uh, they are sharing uh, uh, the same thickness, close to 50 micron. Uh, but of course, for the stack with four dies, four DRAM dies, uh, the latest one it's uh, much more thicker compared to, uh, to the other one. All right. So th there is a, uh, another one. Uh, do you see any, log any logic to logic die stacking using TSV? So currently, that logic to logic is under development, but for sure it will come. Uh, there are big players working on that. So, or it will be like an active interposer as mentioned by Farang, or it will be more the 3D system on chip where we have a clearly die, which is partition. Um, then the two wafers are processed and then uh, attached, um, connected with TSV. To our understanding, that's still under development, but expecting expected, yes, in two two years, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the other question, we'll do our best to answer. So, okay, the webcast is ending. Thank you for listening to the full webcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as earlier said, you will receive an email that will include the recorded session. Please feel free to share the presentation with your colleagues that can benefit from the information that has been presented. You can also uh, find our analysis and reports uh, on more information on our website, uh, imicronews.com. So thank you for joining us today. Do not hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions. Uh, for that, you can use the appropriate contact available on the last slide of the presentation. So have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.